Bible, if you will, uh, to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. <laughs> Today in Ephesians chapter 6, our text, if I stay to my schedule, is Ephesians 6, 5 through 9. The problem is I never finished verse 4 last week. And so, uh, so it's, um, uh, it's, that, it's that idea of what do I do? Do I go back and finish? And, I've committed to the Lord that I will go verse by verse through here, and if I, I'm not going to skip a verse, so we're going to go back today, and we're going to look at verse 4. So Ephesians chapter 6, if you will, verse 4, we read these words. It says this, And you fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and an admonition of the Lord. Let's pray. Father... As we uh, go through these uh, verses quickly today, I pray that you would give us an understanding and an application to our hearts. Lord, I do thank you. Uh, use my words. Touch our hearts. Use, uh, enable the Spirit to work mightily. I do thank you in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Take your Bibles, if you will, back to Ephesians chapter 5 in verse 21. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21. See, we've been talking about walking the way God has called us to do. Um, I told you to go back to Ephesians chapter 5. Uh, that's on page, if you're using the Pew Bible, that's the, uh, the White Bibles, that's, that's page 1016, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but I'm going to have you go back to chapter 4, verse 1. Because in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1, the Word of God tells us this, And I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, um, the Lord beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. And Paul starts a whole series in chapters 5, 6, and 7 on this idea of what it means to be called by God. And he says, first of all, that if we're going to be called by God, if we're going to walk worthy of the calling that God has called us to be. And what, what is that calling? That calling is to be a Christian the way God wants us to be a Christian. You know, in the, in the New Testament, the Word of God tells us that, that the early Christians were called Christians because they were followers of Jesus Christ. And so they lived a life that was so different that the world could tell that they were different. And they said, hey, these people are followers of Jesus. Let me ask you this question. Can, can people in your neighborhood, you know, can your neighbors, can your coworkers, can your friends know that you're different because you have Jesus in your heart. Let me say this. If they can't, you're not walking the way God wants you to walk. See, the Word of God says, Paul, after talking about all the doctrine in chapters 1, 2, and 3, comes to this practical section, and he says, listen, I want you to be the Christians you need to be. He says there's three ways of doing that. Number one, there's the right walk. And in chapter 4, down through verse chapter 5, verse 20, we find that the Word of God tells us um, that, that there's, there's four types of walk. There's walking worthily, there's walking in love, there's walking in, um, um, there's walking in truth, and there's walking in wisdom. We've studied that. And then in, chapters, um, in, in chapter 5, in verse, 20, in verse 22, uh, down through the end of the chapter, he says there's, uh, there's the right, actually it goes all the way to chapter 6, uh, verse 9, but he says there's the right living, there's the right life. And that right life, he gives three examples. And that right, right life is, is described there in chapter 5, verse 21. Look what it says in chapter 5, verse 21. And, and, and in each one of these cases, he gives this, this clause or this thing that we need to have. Just like we need to walk worthy, he says, hey, you need to, you need to submit to one another. Well, how do we submit to one another? He gives three examples of that. Notice what it says in verse 21. He says, submitting to one another in the fear of God. That is the goal of the Christian is to submit to one another. That's not easy. And Paul says, let me explain that. And he, so he gives three examples. He says, couples, this is how you need to live. And in verses 22 down through verse the end of the chapter, verse 35 I think it is, 
The Word of God teaches us that a, a husband's supposed to love his wife and a wife is supposed to be obedient to the husband. This love and obedience relation back and forth, both respecting one another, both submitting to one another. But the Word of God says if we're going to submit, you need to have love, you need to have respect, there needs to be honor, and there needs to be a working together. And we've talked about that. I'm not going to re-preach that message. But then he talks about parenting. And in chapter 6, verses 1 through 4, he talks about parenting, both the, 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 the child's res, uh, responsibility as well as the parent's responsibility. And you notice in chapter, five, chapter 6, in chapter 6, verse 4, children, what's the first thing we do? Obey. You know, that's, that's the idea of respecting. That's the idea of, of reverence. That's the idea of... And, and he goes on, and in verse, in, verse two, in verse 2, he says, Honor your mother and father. Okay, so there's this obedience, this love, and honor that goes along. Same as with the husband and wife. And it's interesting here, there's words to the father. And we've gotten up to verse 3, and in verse 4, we find a new father. I tend to believe that the Word of God teaches us that this term father is not just the men of the household. I think it's a general term for parents. Okay, back in the Bible time, it was um, society was different than it is today, but I really believe he's talking about parents here. And he tells the parent that if we're going to, uh, he gives them two things. He says, first of all, he says there's an exhortation. He says there's a challenge I want to give you. And that challenge is, is this. Do not provoke your children to wrath. I think sometimes I, I, I enjoy provoking my kid. I enjoy stirring that fire a little bit. I am learning that I can't do that with my granddaughter. My granddaughter is, uh, is on the spectrum for, uh, for autism. And I'm finding out with my granddaughter, she doesn't understand this, this kidding around. And so what I say is what I, what, what I have to mean. Okay? But I think that's a biblical truth. We have to be careful. The Word of God says don't provoke. And the, the idea I think we have here in this, uh, in this challenge is that, is that we ought not to arouse or stir our kids, our grandkids, or people around us to anger or to total exasperation and frustration. You know, I think sometimes we're good at, at, at causing people this frustration in life. And I think, the, the, what, 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 I think what Paul's doing, okay, and, and I've always seen, and so I've studied this in depth uh, with this study, I've always seen that Paul was just, he's talking to the couples, he's talking to the parents, he's talking to the, uh, to the workers, and we'll get to that in verses, uh, verses 5 down through verse 9. But I think what Paul's doing is he's giving three examples, both the couple, both uh, parents uh, and kids, and then um, and the employee and employer, and he's saying, listen, submit to one another. And he's telling parents, listen, listen, kids, you have to remember, kids are a gift from God. And you have a responsibility to, uh, to nurture them. You have a responsibility to train them, not to frustrate them. Okay, and he gives this, this challenge. Now, I think there are four things. If I had to, um, um, if I, um, if, if I had to give a, a, a picture here, I think in my mind there are four things that provoke or frustrate kids. And I think it's true with one another. Okay, but there's four things. Let me give them to you real quick. One, failing to accept change. You know, one of the problems I have is I don't understand the younger generation. I don't understand how they dress. I don't understand how the music they listen to. I don't understand, you know, the, the, you know I don't. And people say, well, Dad, well, Dad or well, Grandpa, you're getting old. Well, yeah, I'm old. And I don't understand the change that's taking place. And let me tell you something. I would venture to say you don't understand somebody that's 30 or 40 years younger than you. But you know something? Life is constantly changing. Life doesn't stay the same. And I've seen that in my I've seen that in, in ministry. Life doesn't change. Listen, if North Chester Baptist Church was the same as when we first started 150 years ago, none of us would want to participate in the church. 
Young people look at North Chester and they would come to church and they say, wow, there's a bunch of gray-haired people in this church. <laughs> They're stuck in their way. Change, failing, failing to accept change. I know as parents, we we're, no, you know, my, my rules were always this. And this is my house. These are my rules. You follow my rules. If you don't like it, there's the door. Mm -hmm. How is that accepting change? It's not. Now, I do know that, you know, there has to be some give and take, and I understand that, but there has to be a willingness on my part as a father or our parts as a, as a husband and wife, as a father and mother, to say, okay, my kids and my grandkids, they're going to do things a little bit differently. They've been taught a little bit differently. Right or wrong, there's a change that has taken place, and we have to be willing to make those changes along with them. There's a second thing I think that we find is over control. My daughter, one of my daughters, I won't say which one, one of my daughters, since a very young age, I believe she had said she's moving out of the house and she's not looking back. Why? Because dad's too controlled. Now we have a good relationship with them now, but it, it took a while for us to build that relationship. But dad had his rules. You know, I'm, I, I'm, the, the, the rules that my parents had and the rules that their parents had, and I'm going to stick to my rules and I'm not going to change. And so therefore, it's going to be this way. And, and there was some give and take, don't get me wrong, but they're over control. And I think sometimes over-controlling has the idea or has, a, has a, a tendency of frustrating people. Listen, when I was growing up, I wanted my own independence. And yes, I obeyed my parents' rules, but I also stretched those rules a little bit so I could, I, I, I could be me. Okay? My brother was different than I am. My brother enjoyed sitting down and talking with my parents, and he talked through everything with my parents. I wanted nothing to do with talking to my parents. Don't, you know, I, I'm my own person. If I get myself in trouble, I will get myself out of trouble. You know, I don't need mom and dad to be hovering over me and telling me what to do. And, and you know, we, we have that control aspect. Okay? It's very frustrating. There's, a, there's another aspect. I, th I think under control can also frustrate the kid. Why? Because they don't know the rules. If you have no rules, how can you know what to do? Where's your guidance that goes along with that? You know, I think there needs to be a balance. All in Christian life is a balance. And we need to have this balance. I know, I know kids that, that function so much better when there's rules that are, that are given and, and they say, listen, these are the guidelines. Now, now you have to understand, we have to get to the point that we say, here's the guidelines, but we understand that every now and then there's going to be, boom, something that's going to happen outside the guidelines, and guess what? I believe that there needs to be punishment for that. Why? Because it's a training process. Okay? That's my own personal feeling. But we need to make sure that it's not over controlling. I have to make sure that I don't, I don't tell my kids to jump and they say how high and I want them to do exactly what I tell them to do. And, you know, hey, I don't want anything to do with Christianity if that's the way Christianity is all about. And I think that's what we find in culture today. You know, we find these, there's a, there's, there's a fourth thing I think that we, that we find, okay, and that is the inconsistency. I think that's a big one. You know, we have rules, but, you know, it's all right, you can break it. But that person over here can't. I see that very true in ministry all the time. Well, okay, because you're a, because you're a deacon, you know, we'll, we'll look the other way. Well, no. Pastor and deacon should be leading the example. Not... Allowing us to take, you know, you know, we we we, we live with the with the term, or we understand the term. Do as I say, not as I do. Okay, inconsistency in our walk. I think there needs to be consistency in all that we do, and I tend to think that a father tends to frustrate their kids when we do those things. You know, if I can for a moment, can we take this? And can we throw it into the realm of Christianity? Because I tend to think that there's, there's father 
kids relationship in Christianity. I have some spiritual parents that, you know, have, have impacted my life. I have people that have impacted my life. Listen, you don't live on an island by yourself. What you do impacts those around you, even within the local church. People in your community know that you've called yourself a Christian. Some of you have signs out front of your house that says North Chester Baptist Church. And some the times of the church and your community knows that you go to church. But then they see you living an inconsistent life. Peggy. She goes to North Chester Baptist Church. She runs the ministry, but did you see what she was doing on Facebook? <laughs> That's inconsistent. Now, don't get me wrong. I work for a company. I work for Thurston Motor Lines when I was in Bible College. Okay, Thurston Motor Lines worked out of 69th Street. They had a warehouse, 69th Street. And I would go down there and I'd work through the night and we would unload trucks and reload trucks. So in the morning... Truck drivers could come and deliver all the stuff. It was a it was a, a it was a, a transport company from one area to another. We were just a hub that would unload it and send the trucks back out. Okay. Working working for truckers. It's a foul mouth, evil world. Two of us from Bible College worked down there. And they thought they knew everything a Christian was supposed to be doing. Even though half the stuff they said, well, you're a Christian, aren't you supposed to be doing this? And it gave me an opportunity to just share the gospel. Okay. But you have to understand, the world will have preconceived ideas that aren't necessarily true. And we can't go with what people think. We have to go with what God thinks. Our consistency has to be consistency to the Word of God. And you know something? I find that we all fail when we measure up to the Word of God. We all fall short. Because we don't spend enough time in God's Word. We don't spend enough time allowing the Holy Spirit to minister to our lives. Paul tells fathers, be careful not to provoke your children to anger. Don't get them frustrated. Don't we so often get our brothers and sisters frustrated in the world? And the Word of God says, wait a minute, that's not how we ought to be living. We ought to be living, submitting ourselves one to another. How? In love and in respect. That's the picture that we have through these three illustrations. You know, what is a father supposed to do? Now, I think there's four things that Paul gives us in verse, in verse 4. He gives us four things that we need to be doing. Look what it says. And you fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath. It says, but bring them up in the training and an ad admonition of the Lord. Four things right there in that little mouthful. Number one, we need to understand that we have to bring them up. The term bring them up here, I believe, is talking about nurturing them. It's talking about... It's talking about um, uh, spending time caring for that, that tender plant. A new child is a tender child, and you're supposed to nurture that child. You're supposed to care for that child. You're supposed to give the right food to that child. You're supposed to know when that child is hurting so you can comfort it and you can, you can minister to it. There's that nurture that takes place. It's interesting, if you go back to verse 29 of uh, chapter 5, it's interesting that the Word of God says that's exactly what a husband is supposed to do to the wife. Okay, look what it says in verse 21. For no one ever hated his own body, but nourished it. There's that word. Nourished it is the same word, it's the same Greek word as bring them up. Okay, it's that idea of nourishing them and cherishing them and loving them and caring for them. You know, when we, uh, when we plant our garden in the spring, Pam starts them out, you know, in our, in our, in our, what we call our peg room, it's our coat room. And she starts them out in little pots, 
and they, they, they start out as tender little plants and, and, and then grow and we have to nurture and we have to make sure that they're growing properly. And we have, why? So that when they get to a certain size, we can take them out to the ground and we can put them in the ground and hopefully we'll get tomatoes and we'll get peppers and we'll get, which we did this year, we got tomatoes, peppers and, and uh, zucchini and you know, we, we, we enjoyed the garden as a result of Pam spending that term nurturing those tender plants. The Word of God says that's what we do. But you know something? That's what we do with other young believers, isn't it? Isn't that, that our responsibility to take somebody who is younger than us, who is, who is less mature than us, and we take them under our wings and we teach them instead of sitting back saying, well, look at that Christian. They, 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 did not, they didn't do what they were supposed to do. Listen, criticizing is not getting anywhere. But we need to take them under our wing and we need to love them and we need to respect them and we need to show them and guide them and help them become the plants that God wants them to become. That's what a parent does. We first of all nurture and, and we, we enrich them. Okay, we enrich them, we nurture them, we bring them up. There's a second thing we find in verse 4. In verse 4 it tells us this, to bring them up in the training so not only do we enrich them, but we educate them. There's this training that takes place. In Proverbs chapter 6, or chapter 22 and verse 6, it says, train up a child in the way that he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. We have a responsibility to train those who are under us. You know, I was, I, you know, this week I spent a lot of time looking at master and slave because next week's message is going to be on that, okay? I'm never going to finish these nine verses this morning, so we, we will go to that next week. But, you know, it's interesting that it's believed that in the, in the church, a master at times would be sitting under the teaching of his servant. Think about that. Because God doesn't call everybody to be teachers. But sometimes in the church, see that the picture that Paul is trying to give here is that we're a unique body. The body of Christ. The church. And in the church, there is no one that is master and servant. There's no one that is technically father and son. Even though we use that analogy. Why? Because we're all equal before God. And so the Word of God says when you see somebody who is, who is struggling in their walk, what's your responsibility to do? You come alongside of them, you put their arm around them, you say, listen, my friend, I'd like to sit down and I'd like to show you from Scripture and teach you and train you and help you grow in your walk with the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you don't make them feel guilty, most people would say, I want to grow in my walk. The problem is, we, we hit them across the head and say, you're doing wrong, and now that we've offended them, then we say, will you sit down with me so we can, I can show you how to get better? And most people at that point would say, no, I'm not interested in learning from you, because you haven't had that respect, that submission, that love. The Word of God tells us that we as God's children have to have this training. And I, you know, I, I'm one who I, I, I know that, you know, I have a lot to learn. And I am not, I, I am not put, put um, I, I don't look at, at people who come to me and say, Pastor, you know, Jay Wonderly comes to me regularly and he says, most of the time he's wrong. Right, Jay? Right. Right, okay. Most of the time he's wrong. Sometimes he'll say, you know, Pastor, I got you here. And I, I have no problem learning that way. Because that's the biblical way of learning, isn't it? Where we can learn from one another. The problem is, I pick up the bad habits more than I do the good habits. Because we're human beings. Okay, there's a third thing. Look what else, look what else it says. It says, not only are we supposed to um, supposed to educate them, but we're supposed to encourage them. Notice what it says there in verse 4. It says, and admonish. The word admonish here has the idea of encouraging. Has the idea of, of correcting, but in a, in, a, in a positive way. You know, I tell people all the time, don't criticize what I'm doing. Unless you're going to critique it with a positive way of changing. 
You know, it's easy to be the, the, um, the I don't know what it's called, the, uh, what, the, the, the sofa quarterback, the, what's, it, what's it called? You know? It's easy to sit at your TV and, tell, and yell, at the quarter, or yell, at the, yell at the coach on, on the Eagles team because he just made a wrong call for the players to do. I'm sitting on my sofa and I can yell at that coach, but guess what? I'm not in his shoes. I can criticize very easily. The Word of God says, no, that's not what we do. We build one another up. Okay? Not only do we enrich them, not only do we educate them, but we encourage them. The Word of God tells us we need to encourage them. It's interesting, as you study Scripture, and I don't know if I have a Bible verse for that. Uh, no. Um, it's interesting, as you study Scripture, you find that Paul, over and over, tells Timothy and Titus, both pastors, he says, listen, teach your older men to train younger men. Teach your older women to train younger women. I've had, I've had situations here in the church where somebody's come to me and said, Pastor, you need to talk to this woman because she's really wearing an outfit that's inappropriate. Listen, that's not the pastor's job to do that. That's when you as a woman see a woman that is, that is dressing like the world. You have a responsibility to go to that woman and say, Listen, you know what the Word of God says? Can, can, can I help you grow spiritually? Can I do this in love? Be careful. You don't knock them down first. There's a man here in the church. We always kid about it. He's, he told me one time he got into a fight, knocked the guy down in a fist fight, and then put a track in his pocket. <laughs> I'm telling you, that doesn't work. Because people aren't interested in doing that. Okay? Now, but isn't that how we act spiritually with people? The Word of God says, no, we need to learn to love people. We need to be concerned. You know, we, we live in a society today where fathers aren't being fathers. I read, I read, um, I read this this week that one of the problems in America, one of the problems in the world today, is absentee fathers. I came across this statistic which blew my mind. The average man spends 3.5 seconds a day with their kids. Think about that. 3.5 seconds. And then we wonder why kids aren't growing up properly. How much time are you spending nurturing, training, discipling another believer? Then we wonder why the church is having problems. It's the same thing. We need to be Christians who are concerned for the other. And Paul uses a father and son relationship. And he says, listen, that is what the church needs. A father who's going to love, he's going to encourage, he's going to, he's going to do whatever he can to make that young man become the man of God that God wants them to become. Whoa, we wash our hands of that. Praise the Lord, they're saved. Now they're on their own. No. The Word of God says you come beside them. And you educate them, you train them, you enrich them, you encourage them to walk the way they're supposed to walk. And then there's one last thing. Look what it says in verse 4. We're going to end with this. But one last thing, it says this. It says, an admonish, admonishing, or an admonishing, admission. That's it, admonition, thank you. Um, and, and maybe I should start by to bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. It has to be done in God. You know, as, as, as I took this outline from somebody, you need to enrich them, you need to en educate them, you need to encourage them, and you need to evangelize them. You need to bring, bring our people back to the Word of God. Listen, it's not about, I'm, I'm reading a book right now, it's, it's, on, it's on some of the great pastors through, through the 18th, uh, through the 19th and 20th century. 
And uh, you know, some men that are the, you know did fantastic preaching, did fantastic. A lot of the commentate, a lot of the commentaries that I have are written by these guys. And it just, you know, I, I look at that just great source and, and, and great information, and I just, I, I love hearing what these guys have, do, have done all by the power of the Lord. But the bottom line of this book is we need to go back not to these great men, not to the history of North Chester Baptist Church, but we need to go back to the Word of God. It's about God. It's about Jesus. Why? Because the Word of God says there's no other way to heaven but by Jesus. And my friends, there are people that are walking right past this church this morning who think that they're good enough to get to heaven. Well, it's our job to train one another, to encourage one another, to stir up one another so that we can go out and we can win souls for Jesus Christ. That's the calling of the church. That's what we need to do. How do we do that? By submitting to one another. The next example Paul gives is the example of an employer and an employee, a master and a servant. Okay. Next week we'll look at that. I apologize, I'm not going to finish when I wanted to, but that's not my schedule, that's God's <laughs> schedule. But let's close with a word of prayer. Our Father, I do pray that you would help us to learn to be, to be submissive one to another. Lord, help us to love cherish, nurture, encourage, strengthen, teach those, Lord, who need teaching. And Lord, I have seen many times people who've been saved, who've been, in, uh, who've been a Christian for many years, who need to go back to the ABCs of Scripture because they've taken their eyes off the Lord. And so, Lord, this isn't just for newborns, but Lord, it's for all of us. We need one another. You tell us in your word, forsake not the assemblies of yourself together, but be a blessing to those around us. And so, Lord, help me, make me a blessing to someone today. Help me reach out to that one who's hurting, to that one who, who, who needs to be encouraged in the word, to the one who needs to be trained a little bit more so they can be more effective. Help me to enrich, to educate, to encourage and to evangelize those you place in my life. And I pray the same thing for those around us. But Lord, I pray for each and every one here today that, Lord, we would seek you first. We would put you first in all things. That, Lord, our eyes would not be upon history, would not be upon tradition, would not be upon what we are used to doing, but, Lord, that it would be upon the Word of God because the Word of God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And Lord, I thank you that there's only one way we can truly be a servant of yours. And that's through the, wash, the, the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And so Lord, renew our minds. And if there be one here today who does not know you, that they would be, that they would be washed in the blood of Jesus Christ for the first time. Lord, you were. I do thank you. In Christ Jesus, I, I pray. Amen. Let's stand.